The floating hunts are a legendary event dating back to 1920. I'm sure you've heard of the famous short story, The Most Dangerous Game, which has been adapted hundreds of times into video games, movies, television shows, other stories. That was written in 1924 and based on rumors the author had heard about these human hunts. The floating hunts were started by a big game hunter and occultist named Perry Ambrose and his organization that he called the Gunny Men. The floating hunts offered skilled hunters and soldiers the ultimate safari. Over the years, the Gunny Men went through a number of changes. They started as a business, slowly turned into a ghastly cult, and then in the 60s reverted back to being a business. They always did the same thing, mind you. The hunts never changed. But the people wearing the burlap masks and their motives did change. In 2016, the Gunny Men went through another big change when the daughter of their founder took over the organization in a very bloody coup. We have discussed this before in the episode called The Gunny Sack Races. Lila Ambrose saw potential for growth in the Gunny Men, potential for profit, and most important to her, potential as a source of recruitment. This very rich and very old woman had a lot of ideas, and none of them were anchored by the outdated traditions of the gunny men. Namely, the elitism. The floating hunts had always been by and for the ultra-wealthy. The sort of ne'er-do-well old money assholes who would like to hunt people for sport. Lila saw this as leaving a lot of money on the table. She knew that many, many people around the world had murder in their hearts, but not the resources to get away with it. While continuing the floating hunts, as always she started offering package deals for singles or for groups. Pick a locale, select the number of victims you want, and live out your fantasies. Kill somebody and face no consequences, no repercussions. It was still very expensive, of course, but much less so for one important reason the quality of the victims. You see, the floating hunts had a sterling reputation for providing formidable prey. They wanted ex-military, ex-law enforcement, survivalists, bikers, tough guys who would present a real challenge for seasoned hunters. Truly, they wanted the most dangerous game. But these package deals were quite different. These hunters were not going to be as equipped or as experienced or as skilled. And they didn't want formidable prey. They just wanted victims. Easy kills so they could live out their fantasies. For the package deals, the gunny men started to recruit from street corners from jails and prisons, from rehab centers and cancer clinics, from anywhere that people were desperate enough to do just about anything for a big payday. This is what brought five strangers together one chilly night in the winter of 2017. They sat around a campfire, in the middle of a vast stand of green ash trees. They traded stories about how they had been recruited. 
for one reason or another, they all needed the money badly enough that it was worth the risk. Although they knew that their lives were in great peril and that they would likely die that night, they still had no idea how terrifying it would be. How could they know that a group of psychotic young people were going to recreate the Night of the Long Knives? Drinking whiskey in the kitchen and telling scary stories around the fire. Music, monsters, and mayhem, killers, cannibals, and cults, fearful fiction and furious fact, tall tales, and terrible truths. This is a scary home companion. The gunny men had provided the clients with a double wide trailer so they could all get into their gear. It was a green room of sorts, with two changing rooms, a bathroom, and a large desk with a pretty decent spread of imported cold cuts and various cheeses. Miss Mercy was there. She was sharing a rum punch with the southern gentleman, while the machinist and razor mouth were nibbling prosciutto on fancy crackers. They had their own names, Their own identities, of course, but tonight, they were leaving all of that behind. Tonight, they were not 20-somethings who spent every weekend at LARPs and sci-fi conventions. Tonight, they were not cosplayers. Tonight, they were their avatars, 100% in character, 100% method at all times, no matter how bloody or fucked up things may get. Miss Mercy was wearing the outfit she had died in, a neat little federal-looking suit with an overcoat. She had a blood-spattered federal marshal's badge on her belt, handcuffs, and a taser. The taser was an ad-lib that wasn't authentic to Miss Mercy, But since the gunny men didn't allow guns on the package deals, she called an audible. Southern gentlemen wore boots, a faded leather duster, and a cowboy hat pulled down low over his eyes. He'd spent two weeks making the hat look authentically dirty and battered. He'd even put two real bullet holes in it. The blade in the sheath under his arm was 12 inches long and razor sharp. The machinist kept it simple with a one piece work suit, surgical mask, and a clear face plate on a visor. He was feeding chunks of salami to his lover, Razor Mouth, who was clearly the centerpiece of the room. Razormouth was wearing a custom-made, airbrushed, spandex bodysuit covered with a myriad of scars and cuts and patches of exposed muscle tissue, obscenely gaping wounds at the nipples and genitalia. Already in character, he crouched down like an animal, and he ate while he still could before the mouthpiece went in. He'd crafted his own claws, three long blades with a welded handle that he could grip in his palm so that the knives would come out between the fingers of his fist. They were fully functional. He'd practiced on a side of beef. The mouthpiece was a smile of razor blades, handmade. And as stunning as it looked, it was not at all functional. The mouthpiece had been crafted and then attached to a ball gag 
So once it went in, he would look like Razor Mouth. He would also be robbed of his speech, just like the real McCoy. They awaited ever impatiently the fifth and final member who emerged from the dressing room a bit sheepishly, wearing grease paint and baggy clothes as the one, the only, Gordo the Clown. The machinist cackled. Fucking Gordo, dude? Really? The southern gentleman asked, What happened to the lovers, partner? They're kind of your thing. Which was true. He had been obsessed with Eric Bright and his persona, the lovers, for years. But when it came right down to it, he knew it would make him feel uncomfortable. It was problematic for gender acceptance reasons. So Gordo explained, I just couldn't do it. Since I'm not trans, I felt it might be offensive. Offensive to who, the machinist asked. The people that we're going to kill? You know what I mean. It's a delicate subject. I don't want to be insensitive. So you went with Gordo? The machinist laughed. And then he knelt down and fixed the razor blade smile to razor mouth. So let me get this straight. You didn't want to do the character you love because it's offensive. So you dress as the guy who diddles kids instead. Come on, you, you know I'm not like that. He's a child molester. How is that better? You know, you know... He never once did that to a child who was alive. He only defiled the dead. In what fucking universe is that better? So why did you wait until now to say something to me? Gordo stomped his oversized shoe. Well, honestly, I wanted to wait until it was too late for you to back out. It's much more fun shredding you when you can't run away. Fuck you, Kenneth. Kenneth? Who's that? I don't see any Kenneth. I see the goddamn machinist. I see Razor Mouth. I see Miss Mercy. I see the Southern Gentleman. And I see you, Gordo the motherfucking Clown. What night is this? It's the night of the long knives. What? It's the night of the long knives. That's right, Gordo. That's fucking right. It's our night. How long have we been planning this? And we don't have witless, dumbass teenagers. Nobody tricked or forced into it. Those people out there, they're waiting for us. They took money and came here for us to kill them so we don't have to feel bad about it we don't have to question any of it we can do what we always wanted to do and have the night of our lives yeah but I mean if all of them end up being people of color I'm gonna just like feel weird about it Jesus Christ Gordo I swear to God, pipe down with that shit. Go back to being a keyboard commando tomorrow. Tonight, we hunt. quarter mile away from the trailer, in a freshly cut clearing in the middle of the woods, five people huddled around a bonfire. 
It was huge. Much more of a fire than was needed on a somewhat chilly night. But it wasn't there to keep them warm. This was a signal fire. A pandemonic torch. A symbol of the night being celebrated. The night of the long knives had begun with a bloodbath around a bonfire, and so it would begin here as well. Four of the victims stared into the fire. They'd already done a meet and greet, but it had dried up fast. They knew the killing would start soon. They didn't know what to expect other than no guns. But they were to be hunted and they could do whatever they had to do to survive the night. If they lived, they got paid. If they died, that money went to whoever they had stipulated. And for the four of them, that was all that it was about. There were three men, one of whom looked to be on the verge of death already, gaunt and emaciated. The other two were clearly desperate for some kind of fix. One of the women had terminal cancer. She was only doing this horrible thing so that she could have a little money to leave for her daughter. And then there was the fifth, Epiphany Dubois. Epiphany was a little different. She looked at the other four and how they just sat there like they were already dead. Epiphany wasn't staring into the fire. She was looking around the tree line for signs of life, so she was the first to see them coming. Look, look, she told the others, pointing to Miss Mercy as she came through the trees. No, there, said the other woman, and they saw Gordo the Clown bounding into the clearing on an invisible pogo stick, What the fuck, one of the men said. The southern gentleman and the machinist both emerged, each one coming from a different corner of the clearing. Epiphany asked her cohorts, y'all gonna run or fight? But none answered, because they had seen Razormouth come onto the field of play and were transfixed by his abhorrent majesty. Under the pale moonlight, the razor blade smile dazzled like the guts of a diamond. He ran, stooped over, animalistic, his spandex scars already damp with sweat, his finger blades scratching furrows in the earth. The other killers were chill, swag, cool as fuck, walking like they were the bad guys in a horror movie but not Razor Mouth. He was scrambling towards the fire at an alarming pace, hungry for blood. When Epiphany realized no one else was going to fight, she started to run, making a beeline away from Razor Mouth and into the gap between Miss Mercy and the gentleman. And they might have tried to cut her off, but Razormouth had already pounced onto one of the men and was stabbing him as they howled, and the other killers couldn't help but to watch. Blood spattered onto the machinist's faceplate as he came in for a closer look. With an audience, Razormouth stopped stabbing with the knife claws and started kissing the man with his grotesque array of bladed teeth. He ran his face back and forth over the man's face and neck like a cheese grater, tearing his features to shreds. Everyone else started running too. For the other woman, she didn't look where she was going and bumped into Gordo. He grabbed her by the elbow, pulling her close and sniffing her hair before shoving her to the ground 
and taking out his pearl-handled straight razor. Gordo fell on top of his victim, and it was clumsy, but ferocious. He was fully immersed in the character, and he started to cackle as he slashed at her with the long, thin blade, hacking hunks out of her forearms and hands until she got tired of fighting back and then slicing open both sides of her neck. Neat quick cuts. And then he carved furrows into her heaving chest as the blood cascaded all over the both of them. The violence was so extreme and so intimate that even Razormouth stopped his carnage and watched Gordo's naked rage. Holy shit, said the machinist. Holy shit, said Miss Mercy. Mm -hmm, said Razormouth. The gentleman said, God damn, Sean. Who's Sean? I'm Gordo the motherfucking clown. The killer screamed. He got to his feet, soaked in blood, and licked his lips. Two down. Three to go. Epiphany was not fleet of foot. At her size, she was actually quite slow. But when motivated, she moved like a juggernaut. She plowed through the underbrush, breaking trail for herself as she got as far away from the clearing as she could. It didn't take long before reality came crashing down on her. Her legs got tired, her lungs more so. She found herself struggling for breath. The stress, the shock, the exertion, and her weight were not a good combination. She thought it best to sit down, put her back against a green ash, and catch her breath. It took a couple of minutes before she stopped wheezing. She quieted herself. She started to listen. Immediately, she heard someone else. They were hyperventilating, being just as loud as she was trying to be quiet. She looked around and saw one of the men from the fire. He was hiding in some shrubs near the base of a tree. Maybe it was withdrawal or the DTs or the fear, but the guy was having a full-on panic attack. Footsteps, murmuring voices approaching. Epiphany pulled down lower, closer against the tree, and tried to breathe as quietly as she could. She might not look like a survivor, but Epiphany didn't come here planning to die. The gunny men had recruited her out of a Louisiana work camp, Three years before the end of her sentence, just to be here for this. Getting three years of her life back might have been enough to take the risk, but then they had offered Epiphany cash money, more money than she'd ever seen in her life, and they promised a chance at future employment. So for her, this wasn't just a game of survival. It was a job interview. She didn't know what kind of job, but right now that didn't matter so much because if she didn't survive, nothing mattered. 
The voices got closer, the steps louder. And then the skittish guy broke cover, tried to make a run for it. Howdy, partner, the gentleman said in a truly terrible southern drawl. He kicked the running man's legs out from under him, and he tumbled and landed in front of Miss Mercy. With a tentative hand, she reached out and zapped him on the side of the neck with her stun gun. He spasmed, and she zapped him again. Go ahead, do it, she whispered to the gentleman. Finish him. You don't want to? he asked. No, 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 no. I like to watch. Do it. Fucking stab him for me. The gentleman crouched down over the twitching homeless man. But his knife was also twitching with trepidation. You know, with us not being in a car, this doesn't feel right. Like, It's not in character, right? Stop being a fucking pussy and do it, she said. Epiphany watched on, surprised. Neither of them really wanted to kill that guy. They were playing at it, but they weren't living it. She thought about attacking them. She had the drop, but... Didn't like the odds. She couldn't risk exposure just to save that poor bastard on the ground. Perhaps they wouldn't. But then the other killers arrived. And with no discussion or prompting, Razor Mouth set upon the prone man and used his finger knives to open him up, throat to crotch. The monster wallowed in blood, smearing himself with it, reveling in it, breathing heavily, looking around the group like he was laying claim to the kill. The machinist caught the vapors inside. He wasn't about getting his hands dirty. He just wanted to watch his pet monster do it for him. And so far, it was... Everything he had wanted. Three down, the machinist said. Just the junkie and the fat girl left. The gentleman laughed. She's not exactly the final girl I had in mind, right? More like Friday the 13th pan of fudge. Gordo snapped. Jesus, you guys. Body shaming? Really? Mercy said, We're about to rip this girl's guts out, and you're on about body shaming? I've always said you're the craziest one of us all, Gordo. And Gordo had to admit, You know what? You're right. I feel like I'm losing focus. I'm method. We're all method, right? I need to get method. I need to get back into character. You guys go on, and I'll catch up in a few. I've got an idea. Gordo walked away, heading back to the clearing, back to his first kill, with a renewed sense of purpose. The machinist said, Let's split up, look around for the other two. Call out if you see either of them. This is actually really fun, you guys. I I want to finish it out as a group. Machinist and Razor Mouth went one way. The Southern Gentleman went another. And Miss Mercy lingered for a moment. She waited until she was alone, and then she took out a hidden cell phone and started taking selfies, crouched down, next to the corpse that Razormouth had gutted. Epiphany got to her feet and walked over, not even being particularly stealthy, as Mercy was so wrapped up in striking poses. 
She finished, put her phone inside her coat, and stood up to face Epiphany, looking down at her. So, she said, I'm, um, I'm, listen, Mercy stuttered. She was immediately shut up with a meaty slap across her face. She got woozy. And then a left hook to the stomach knocked the wind right out of her. She hit the ground next to the dead man. Epiphany went through her pockets as Mercy gasped for breath like a flopping fish. She came away with handcuffs, a stun gun, and a blood-spattered badge. You the law? she asked. No, no, no. It's part of the cosplay. Mercy was getting her breath back. She propped herself up on one elbow. This is exactly what Miss Mercy had on when she died. Who? Miss Mercy, the woman said. And then Epiphany tased her. and She spasmed and vomited all over her nice coat. Epiphany dragged Mercy over to a tree of about the right size, tased her again for safety, and then stretched her out around the trunk on the ground and used the handcuffs to connect one of her wrists to one of her ankles. Now you stay quiet, she said, and zapped Mercy again. She walked away, stomping loudly into the brush. When the coast was clear and all was quiet, Mercy started to shout for help, which was perfect because Epiphany was hiding behind a tree 50 feet away, laying in wait. That was just what she wanted. Calm down, the southern gentleman said. It's mercy, the bound woman hissed at him. Sorry, of course, of course, mercy, Miss Mercy. What happened, Miss Mercy? That big one got me. Check my coat for the keys. The gentleman fumbled trying to dig quickly through the pockets without copping a feel, an instinct that he had to battle. Hurry up, she said. My tits are not going to bite. They bickered, not realizing that Epiphany was standing behind him already, holding a branch in her hands that looked like that club Captain Caveman used to carry, tapered on the holding end, and like a foot wide across the walloping end. Gino, look out. And Gino, the southern gentleman, would have looked out, but it was already too late. That club came down on the back of his neck, right at the juncture where the skull connected to the spine, and it crunched. Southern gentleman went ragdoll, collapsing on top of his friend. He shit his pants and died, just like that. Epiphany knelt down and frisked the gentleman. She took his knife from the sheath and marveled at the size of it. You mind screaming some more, lady? You are really helping me out. Fuck you, you goddamn bitch. You killed him, she snapped. Did I? Y'all delicate. Mercy sobbed as quietly as she could. 
After a few minutes, she realized Epiphany was gone. Gordo the Clown returned to the bonfire. Cosplay was all about becoming your character. Not just dressing like them, living life behind their face. They had all five of them been inspired by a man called the Larpsecutioner. Inspired to become cosplay killers. The Larpsecutioner had shown them the way that they didn't have to be limited to cosplaying as anime characters or superheroes. They could lead the lives of people walking the dark path. They could become villains. Evil incarnate. And then shed that persona when they removed the costume and go back to being themselves. There was no limit to who you could be, to how many who's you could be. You just had to embrace it. So if Sean was going to be Gordo, he needed to be Gordo. He needed to live the part as Gordon Jones had lived it. Which is why it made perfect sense to him in this context to go back to his first victim, the first person he'd ever killed in his life, and to look at her while he masturbated. I Listen, I know. But it's not about being horny. He wasn't horny. Exactly. This wasn't about that. This was about being method. Gordo was a necrophile. He pleasured himself with the bodies of his dead victims. While Sean wasn't ready to go that far... He was convinced that a sensible compromise was to peel back the ripped, bloody shirt from that lady's ripped, bloody breasts and have a try at pounding one out. He set down his razor, got down to his knees. He tugged his baggy pants down just far enough that he had full access to himself and tugged his baggy shirt up just far enough that he could touch his nipples. He stared at the dead woman, thinking about how hot her blood was when it splashed on him. And he felt his manhood coming to life in his hand. What the fuck? Epiphany was speechless. She was standing at the edge of the clearing, the stun gun in one hand, the gentleman's knife in the other, and she was watching a clown jerk off over a corpse. My lord, what is this world, she said to herself. And she walked over to Gordo, who was fully engrossed in his labors and not paying attention. It wasn't until she was close enough to touch him that the clown realized she was there. He spun around, still clutching his hard cock in one hand and pinching his nipple with the other. It's not what you think. It's not what you think. I'm just being method, I swear. He fell down as he backed up. She leaned over and zapped him in the ribs. He jerked but didn't go unconscious. He started to crawl away on his elbows. It's not me. I'm just being the character. Don't judge me for this. She zapped him again. He twisted away from her and reached out for his pearl-handled straight razor on the ground. He managed to grab it by the wrong end, pinching the blade between his fingers. 
which proved very painful when Epiphany brought her boot down on the back of his hand. Fingers broke. Metacarpals splintered. And the pitiless steel of that razor dug deep into the meat of Gordo's hand. He howled. She zapped him again, and he went quiet. She was going to zap him again for safety, but the stun gun was out of juice. She still had the oversized knife and held it while looking at the unconscious clown. She knew that the smart thing would be to kill him, quick, before he woke up. Then the clown was no longer a problem. But Epiphany, she'd never stabbed anybody before. She didn't like the idea of stabbing somebody, nor did she think that she was capable of killing a person in cold blood didn't matter who it was. Self-defense is one thing, but this creep was unconscious. She would have cuffed him, but since she didn't have any more handcuffs, Epiphany just decided to break his other hand. That way, worst he could do was bleed on her. It felt like a win, but the win was short-lived. She heard two men laughing, coming through the trees. Razormouth was dragging the body of the other escapee. The man was now missing several pieces, a couple of which the machinist was carrying. The two killers were giddy off the hot blood, the panic, and the fear, and they were singing the praises of their idol, the larp executioner. Then they saw Epiphany, backlit by the embers of the dying bonfire. Gordo the clown sprawled out at her feet and the gentleman's knife in her hand. She said, I've got your pan of fudge right here, you sick fucks. Come get a slice. Razormouth looked up at the machinist, suddenly hesitant. The machinist urged him, go, go! And the monster moved forward, dropping the corpse he was dragging, rising up to his full height, brandishing his hands full of blades. The orange embers of the fire gave his razor blade smile a glinting jack-o'-lantern glow as he charged her. She lowered her shoulders as he raced at her. At the very last minute, she decided she didn't want the knife. It felt wrong in her hand. So she threw it at the monster, who ducked it, stutter-stepped a little bit, and then came in low towards her belly, so soft and full of guts. And then she raised her knee as hard as she could right into his face. It was an instinctive, defensive move, one she immediately regretted when that shock wave of pain hit her. The razor jaw had shredded the skin and meat from her knee, revealing the scratched-up bone plate of her kneecap glistening through. It was easily the worst pain she had ever felt in her life. That said... It was tempered just a little bit by the accompanying sound that had come from Razormouth's head. 
That razor blade smile of his was set on a ball gag. While her knee strike had ruined her knee, torn her flesh, spilled her blood, it had also snapped and horrifically dislocated his jaw on both sides with an audible crunching and grinding of bone against bone. Razormouth's jaw hung limp and loose halfway down his neck. The ball gag and the razor blade smile fell out, hit the ground. His mouth stayed agape like a fucking Tex Avery cartoon and the monster began to scream in pain before collapsing in a pool of his own blood and drool. He was going into shock from the pain. So, even though her knee looked terrible and hurt like a bitch, this still felt like a win to Epiphany. The machinist was blubbering. He knelt over the monster, trying to comfort his agony. After a moment, a futile, endless moment, he pulled a small communicator from his costume. I'm calling it, he said. We need a medic. It's over. It's all over. Just send a medic. And then he looked up at Epiphany, tears in his eyes. Help him, he pleaded. And Epiphany, despite the pain, <laughs> well, she couldn't help but to laugh at the audacity of that shit. Medic wearing a burlap mask tended to Epiphany's knee. It looked bad. It hurt bad. And it would take many weeks to heal. On the plus side, there was no major muscle or nerve damage. Epiphany was given a bottle of water and a handful of pain pills. An hour later, feeling only a hair better, she was led by two armed gunny men to the double-wide trailer, which was no longer a green room for the guests, but an interview room for the applicant. The gunnies stayed at the door. Epiphany went in alone, where she found only one person there waiting for her sitting at a desk reading a file of paperwork. Much to Epiphany's surprise, it was a teenage girl. Wearing the sensible pantsuit and loosely tied bun of someone much older, perhaps, but a 15-year-old kid all the same. Across from her was an empty chair, Hello, Epiphany. The girl stood up and chirped. Is it okay that I call you Epiphany? It is such a beautiful name. But I would be happy to call you Miss Dubois if you prefer. Please sit, sit. Epiphany hobbled over to the chair and took a seat. Nah, Epiphany's okay. Who are you? 
I'm Jessica. Jessica, meanwhile. It's nice to meet you, Epiphany. What is this? You indicated that you were interested in employment. Since you fit a certain profile that appeals to my employer, she sent me to talk to you to see if you're a good fit for the job. No offense intended, Jessica, but uh, why you? Jessica puffed out her chest just a little bit. Miss Ambrose thinks I'm a good judge of character. She's looking for good people to fight in the war against the ghastly ones. Don't worry, it'll all make sense. Thanks for listening to another episode of A Scary Home Companion. I hope you enjoyed this season finale, because I sure as hell enjoyed bringing it to you. Interact with the show on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you'd really like to support the show, look for us on Patreon. Patrons get early access to episodes, behind-the-scenes commentaries and videos, and exclusive content like the upcoming Patreon-only episode, Apex Predators Aftermath. You can also contact the show directly by emailing us at a scary home companion at gmail.com. The episode was edited and produced by Jeff Davidson. Featured music by A.K. Kamel, the giver of illness, with the other side of Dark Waters. Dead End Canada, as if there's another kind of Canada, with Witch Hunt, Technology of Silence with Countdown, Kiaz with Ambush, Monarchs, with that song that really popped and you loved, it's all over now. Deal the villain with Face Breaker. And the theme music, as always, by Chelsea Oxendine. It's not-